residing in a Southern California suburb, was a seemingly close-knit, picturesque family, a happy wife, successful husband, and two handsome sons. From the outside looking in, the Menendez family was living a good life filled with opportunity and a promising future. But from the inside, the distance between them was growing wider and wider, which would ultimately lead to a shocking and grisly scene at their Beverly Hills estate. Brothers Lyle and Eric Menendez were born into wealth, living in the shadow of their father, Jose's, success. Jose was an immigrant who came to America to escape Castro's Cuba in 1960 at age 15. Later, he attended Southern Illinois University on a swimming scholarship, but left at 19 to be with his love interest, Kitty. The couple moved to New York, where Jose continued his education, receiving a degree in accounting while also working part-time as a dishwasher. Jose eventually landed a position with RCA in the records division, signing high-earning X. Jose and Kitty soon introduced two sons into the world, Lyle and Eric, born nearly three years apart. The family lived in a million-dollar estate in Princeton, New Jersey, where the boys attended Princeton Day School, where they filled their time with soccer and tennis. Jose was a very serious businessman, and as his career in entertainment continued to thrive, he decided to move his family to Los Angeles, where he began working for International Video Entertainment, later known as Life Entertainment. They first lived in Calabasas, before moving to Beverly Hills. Kitty was generally well-liked, while Jose received mixed impressions. Meanwhile, the boys began their way down what would become a troubling path. Eric befriended another teen named Craig Signorelli, the son of a prominent TV industry executive with whom he played tennis. After being taunted by members of a rival high school, both Eric and Craig were beaten up severely in a street fight deriving from the heckling. The two friends remained close and eventually co-wrote a screenplay titled Friends. The plot involved a son murdering his parents for their inheritance. Along the way, the brothers experienced two serious run-ins with the law. The first was a burglary at a home in Calabasas, and the second was a grand theft at a house in Hidden Hills, amounting to over $100,000 in stolen money and jewels between both homes. Jose hired lawyers for both his sons and dealt with the crimes the way he would deal with any prickly business problem. $11,000 in damages was paid and the stolen items and money were returned. Some friends of the family even dismissed the events as rich kids, sick jokes. To avoid any issues with Lyle attending Princeton, and because Eric was underage, Jose decided that Eric would take the blame. He received probation, as well as compulsory counseling. Kitty was referred to Beverly Hill psychologist, Dr. Jerome Ozeal, to work with her son, who continued to work with Eric for some time to come. Eric transferred to Beverly Hills High School, while Lyle went back east to study at Princeton University. Aside from these incidents, it seemed that Kitty and Jose just wanted the best for their children, who were given opportunities to acquire the best things in life. But their high expectations were further tarnished when Lyle was caught cheating in Psychology 101 at Princeton University. Despite every effort made by Jose to convince Princeton authorities to reinstate Lyle, he was expelled from the university. The suspension lasted a year. Extremely proud to have a son attend a top Ivy League school, this incident deeply disappointed Jose. To save face, he urged his son to stay in Princeton during the suspension to avoid having to explain the situation to anyone in Los Angeles. A squeaky clean facade was beginning to reveal signs of hidden flaws. Lyle returned to Los Angeles anyway and was given a job at his father's company. His job performance had him quickly living up to the stereotypical expectations of a rich, spoiled kid who had everything handed to him. By not working very hard, he earned a bad reputation among his colleagues. His undermining work ethic included slacking off, frequently being tardy, leaving early to play tennis, and showing very little interest in his overall duties. Allegedly causing a major rift between Lyle and his father, Jose paid for an abortion 
for one of Lyle's girlfriends. This caused Lyle to become infuriated about not being allowed to deal with his own problems. He moved out of the main house and in to the guest house. After all of these disappointments, reports reveal that there were some indications that Jose had planned to revise his will, growing tired of financing his sons. One day, Kitty received a call from Lyle. He was irate and verbally abusive over the phone. What was expressed is unknown, but the call from the guest house to their main house reportedly took place just a few days before the Menendez's lives would take a turn for the worse. On August 20th, 1989, armed with shotguns and an alibi, Lyle and Eric entered their Beverly Hills mansion den, raised their weapons, and the shots went off. Jose and Kitty were murdered in cold blood by their own sons. In an attempt to stage the grisly scene to appear as though it had been gang-related, the brothers shot both parents in the kneecaps. Police received a 911 call from Eric, whose hysteria and grief during the call seemed so genuine that it left very little room to even consider the brothers had anything to do with it. But the convincing didn't stop there. During questioning, the brothers went on to suggest that the crime could have been mafia related and that they were at the movies at the time of the murder, presenting movie tickets to support their alibi. Within days, Lyle would hire bodyguards to protect them claiming to be afraid that they could be killed by the same people who killed their parents. Furthering the act, the eulogy given by Eric was described as such a strong performance that it was enough to keep the brothers from being questioned for a long while. This led police to investigate Jose's business ties, and while the investigators were on a wild goose chase, the brothers' spending habits became suspicious. They dished out large sums of money on Rolexes, a Porsche for Lyle, and a Jeep Wrangler for Eric. Eric also purchased a $50,000 a year tennis coach and spent $40,000 to put on a rock concert with the promoter that ended up cheating him out of a deal. Lyle also purchased a restaurant in Princeton. In total, the boys spent about $700,000 within six months of their parents' death. In March 1990, seven months after the murder, the Menendez brothers were arrested. The circumstances of how evidence began to be collected against them was rather extraordinary, as well as morally and legally very complicated. The boys were outed by a woman named Judalon Smith, who had been in a relationship with Eric Menendez's therapist, Dr. L. Jerome Ozeal, whom Eric was still working with up to this point. The information she provided broke the case wide open, and not only did what she revealed provide hard evidence against the boys, but it left Dr. Ozeal's own integrity to be questioned. After breaking off her relationship with Ozeal, Smith went to the police to tell them what she had learned during her relationship. She claimed she had been standing outside of Ozeal's office when she heard Eric confess the murder to him. She told police a significant amount of information in regards to the murder. She said she knew that the shotguns had been purchased in San Diego and that the boys used fake IDs to buy them. She also knew that Ozeal had tapes recollecting his sessions with Eric and Lyle on October 31st and November 2nd, 1989, in which he had heard their confessions. In addition, she knew that he had a tape of their session from December 11th of the same year. In an ironic twist, ultimately, during their trial, Judalon Smith was used as a witness for the defense in an attempt to discredit Dr. Ozeal, who was the prosecution's main witness, despite originally attempting to conceal his incriminating tapes to protect the boys. The courtroom also learned that during the time Dr. Ozeal had begun working as Eric's therapist, he was already on a five-year probation for unethical conduct, after creating a verbal contract with a patient who was unable to pay his bill to do over 300 hours of manual labor at Ozeal's house as compensation. And by the time of the brothers' trial, Ozeal had two complaints against him from two women, Judalon Smith and Alex Corey, causing his license to practice therapy to be suspended. Smith claimed that Ozeal had been manipulative in their relationship, playing games with her mind and giving drugs to her that he was not licensed to prescribe for her. The Attorney General's charge read, 
This case involves the respondent, a psychologist, who engaged in sexual, social, and business relationships with two patients while he and the patients had a psychologist-patient relationship. In addition, the respondent disclosed professional competences to one of the patients, furnished controlled substances without proper medical authorization or supervision to both patients, and forged the name of a physician in a letter. Because of the circumstances in which his parents had put him into therapy, Ozil had Eric sign waivers of the usual confidentiality agreement so Ozil could share what he had learned with Jose and Kitty when necessary. It was not a traditional arrangement, and many doctors would not have agreed to breaking this type of confidentiality, but Jose Menendez was a persistent man who had orchestrated it. Due to this, the defense would later claim that Eric could never feel safe to talk about being psychologically abused or physically molested by his father. Ozil spent six long days on the stand, forced to defend his own credibility, as well as testifying against the brothers, leaving some to feel that it was a diversionary tactic for the defense. Dr. Ozil claimed that he'd hid the confession tapes and kept silent about them for fear that the brothers would retaliate against him, saying, I was of the firm belief that Eric and Lyle were planning to murder me. Ozil recalled the session of Eric's confession, going on to say that Eric was feeling extremely agitated, depressed, and alienated over his parents' death to the point of being suicidal. He told Ozil that he could see the scene of his parents' death and asked the doctor to take a walk because there was something that he wanted to tell him, but he didn't want to tell him in the office. According to Ozil, on a park bench in Beverly Hills, Eric claimed that the plan began after he and his brother had watched a BBC program on television in which the lead character had killed his father. Investigators would later learn that this programming was actually likely to be Billionaire Boys Club, which had aired on television three weeks before the murder. The similarities from the movie to the boys' behavior was so striking that they believed this to be the inspiration that Eric was referring to when he said BBC. In short, the film was about a group of Beverly Hills boys who murdered two people, one of which is their father. As further compelling evidence, the boys in the film drove a Jeep and had Rolexes, which were some of the first purchases the Menendez brothers made after the murder. And ironically enough, the film was released by Live Entertainment, of which Jose had been the CEO. Also in the confession, Eric told Ozil that while Lyle wanted to wait to carry out the murder so they'd have more time to plan it, he decided they needed to commit the murder soon, or they would lose their nerve, and mentioned buying shotguns with stolen identification. Ozil also said that Eric confessed that the reason that they killed their mother too was because they couldn't imagine a scenario in which they could kill their father without also killing her. She would be a witness. As deeply unhappy as she was, she would be hopelessly lost without their father, despite the emotional damage he had caused her as well. But Ozil wasn't the only person Eric confessed the murders to. He also confided in his friend, Craig Signorelli, who later coordinated with investigators after they showed up at his door telling him that Menendez was a suspect. Signorelli agreed to wear a wire to get Eric's confession on tape, but the attempt was unsuccessful. Eric denied everything. The year before the murder, Craig and Eric had collaborated on a screenplay about a rich young man who murders his parents in their home. The judge would not allow the screenplay to be used as evidence during the trial, but it was, however, still a troubling marker of the future crime, as well as the first time Craig had ever heard Eric make this sort of confession. Twelve days after the actual murder occurred, Craig would hear a confession that the crime had come to life which Eric later recanted during Craig's failed attempt to get it on tape. The Supreme Court of the State of California had also ruled that while the tape of Ozil's actual session with the boys was inadmissible, the tapes of their confession that they had killed their parents were admissible as evidence. Because of this, they could no longer plead innocent. About a week before their separate trials began simultaneously, the defense would announce their strategy that the boys had killed their parents in self-defense after suffering years of psychological, physical, and sexual abuse under their care. The defense claimed that Eric had been sexually molested by his father for 12 years, between the ages of 6 and 18. They claimed that the most recent molestation had happened just a week before his parents were killed. The defense painted their picture of Jose Menendez as a man who is not known to be kind and, in fact, had many enemies. He was also said to be known to humiliate and threaten people at work, and to have had an overall toxic sense of machismo. In addition, 
he was known to be a serial adulterer who had had a mistress for eight years, on top of other girlfriends. Meanwhile, the prosecution, who sought the death penalty, argued that the brothers had killed their parents so they could claim the $14 million estate that was their inheritance. Ultimately, the defense was convincing enough to get a hung jury for both juries, resulting in a deadlocked mistrial. The case attracted a media frenzy and became so high profile that by the second trial, cameras were prohibited. In the second trial, the brothers were prosecuted together with one defense team and a single jury. At this point, it was no longer about whether or not the Menendez brothers committed the crime, but about why they'd done it. The defense leaned in heavily on their argument of sexual abuse, but to no avail. The jurors convicted the brothers of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. The Menendez brothers both rejected the death penalty in favor of a life sentence in prison without the possibility of parole. For years to come, the brothers would be housed in separate facilities and were only able to communicate through letters to one another. It wouldn't be until 2018 that they'd finally be reunited when Lyle was transferred to a San Diego prison where Eric had spent the last five years. While Lyle was transferred to the prison in February, the brothers didn't see each other until April when he was transferred into Eric's section, a section that allows inmates to interact. The brothers saw each other for the first time since 1996, and upon their reunion, reportedly came to tears as they shared an embrace. The Menendez brothers are bonded for life, not only by blood, but by the blood on their hands. <laughs>